Okay, so joining us today, we have Coffeezilla, um, the YouTuber, investigative, uh, wait, investigative journalist, does that kind, like it investigative kind of, YouTuber? Yeah, <laughs> a little recently, definitely. Yeah, and um, so I I had heard of your channel um, many times, actually, over the past, like, I guess, past year or so. But it was only recently that I, I started uh, looking at a bunch of your content. And I also saw your long form interview with Lex Friedman, which was very good. We, we covered Lex recently as a like as a guru subject. Um, but it, it was very interesting to hear. So for people, maybe maybe you are probably better placed to do this. So if people have no idea what it is you do on your channel? How do you like not shell blurb it? Sure. I think I uh, expose scams and fraud. It started with really predatory advertising. Probably the reason you guys have heard of me is because I ran a show called Fake Guru. So people very smart put two and two together, said decode the guru is a guy who does fake guru. These guys should be buddies. Um, but and that's probably how I first heard about you guys as well. Um, I was telling Matt I had heard about you before you reached out. Um, so that's, I started with the predatory advertising stuff and the fake gurus like selling get rich quick courses. You know, they, they flash the lifestyle, they sell you an unrealistic dream and it's your fault if it doesn't succeed, you know, that, all that stuff. Uh, and then recently it's kind of gone very much kind of a hard right in the crypto direction because it's, even more grifters and even more scammers and even more blatant and outrageous. And, you know, it's, it's insane. So it's just fascinated me. Um, but I have a soft spot in my heart for the, for the, the people out there, the good old fashioned, uh, you know, people out there, hucksters, I guess. Yeah. So one interesting thing for me is like Matt and I in our content have like tended to avoid the, like traditional religious gurus or alternative health figures, um, the the like the kind of spiritual gurus or you know the people that are like outright cult leaders. We did do Reverend Moon, but that was mainly because we had a, a friend who has a podcast for ex Moonies, um, and so we we've focused on people that are in what we call the like secular guru space. You're kind of Jordan Peterson is prototypical or, or Eric Weinstein would be another one. Um, but we did do recently and are about to finish like a tech season. Um, and we ended up not going too far into the Bitcoin or crypto kind of world. We, we did want to do, and we, we will do some people from that space, but your content, at least recently um and in the, the the discussion you had with lex as well uh like heavily digs into that world and also uh looks at figures that are you know popular celebrities and their interaction with like cryptos and nfts and it, it was in the spirit of i noticed both things that overlap and things which seem to differ between those kind of characters that were interesting um and i so you mentioned, you know, the the traditional gurus having an appeal, but one one of the things I noticed is for your investigations, especially the recent ones, there it seems to me as like an outsider with a you know not very good grasp on finance and that kind of thing, that they're very technically involved, and you have to know a hell of a lot about you know complex financial systems to be able to ask the right kinds of questions. And so I was wondering, like. Is that something that you had or did you have to, you know, develop those skills and how, how specialized are those skills? You know, do they, do they cross boundaries or do you think like you really need to know a lot about economics and finances to deal with crypto and Bitcoin kind of stuff? It's a great question. I mean, I think with this crypto stuff, I, so I'll give you my backstory. My only background really is I did an undergraduate in chemical engineering. I got some decent math. Uh, uh, I got some decent science, just critical thinking, but nothing related to 
the tech of the blockchain or crypto or anything like that. I have no formal education in it. I've just always had an interest in fraud. And I think I just started paying attention to the blockchain because it was interesting to me. Oh, you can actually trace where this money goes. So different than traditional finance. And I think more interesting in a way because of that. I mean, you don't have to rely on what somebody says. Like if you know their wallet, you can see what they're doing at such and such a time. You don't have to ask questions about it. So that really scratched an itch that I didn't think I, I, I didn't know I had. I was just like, what is somebody doing with their money at a certain period of time? It's actually kind of, kind of interesting, kind of uh, fascinating, fascinating, especially if they make public statements to the contrary, right? Like if they say I'm holding and then you see they're selling, like that's, that's so interesting to me. Uh, so I really feel like my skills are not, it's nothing crazy. It's just like knowing how to use a, f a few tools. I just feel like I'm slightly ahead of the curve. And so when people see my investigations, they think, oh, you're so specialized. You're so technically savvy. It's like, well, not really. I'm just like probably six months ahead of everybody, like most average people. And so being six months ahead in such a nascent industry feels like you're, you know, miles uh, ahead. But there are, going to your point, it is very interesting where crypto is this strange thing where you're promising a very simple idea, but you're selling a complex one. So you're promising, or sorry, I'll say you're selling like, you're selling like this dream, right? But the actual product you're giving someone is very complicated. And to understand what it actually is does take some level of sophistication. It's not, it's not as simple as like you're giving someone a book. It's a oftentimes, some sophisticated computer code written in Solidity, which most people don't know how to read, uh, have no idea what any of it means. And the complicated economic dynamics of that particular coin are not immediately obvious. So what you said is true, where people can get stuck in just believing what the, whoever it is that's selling them the coin says. They say, hey, we're going to the moon. Okay, it's a very simple idea to understand. I'm, I'm going to make a lot of money. But it's complicated to understand the market dynamics and how this might end up just being a Ponzi scheme. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if I answered your question all the way. Yeah, you you did. And it, the, there's a very specific follow-up that I have that is about a specific case, but it probably applies a bit more widely. So I watched your, uh, your videos on Jake Paul and his tendency to promote like various different NFTs. I'm sure he has many other things that he, sure. he does or oh, cryptocurrencies it might be i um, i might be actually mixing the two up but you did both you treat it both yeah that that also stands the reason Checks so out. you you did what you just described in those videos like you traced identified accounts which are likely to be his wallets um and uh like not not incredibly sophisticatedly hidden as you mentioned right the, all right. going into things which are labeled with around usernames that he has referred to himself as but in in that circumstance i was wondering so um do you are you uh ambiguous on this point or do you think it's actually him that does that or is it somebody who would manage his finances like is jake paul likely to be setting up you know wallets and kind of moving money around or is that somebody who is working on behalf of him who would you know uh, like have special not that specialist skills in it i'm just curious as to what extent yeah that's, that's a, it's a great question i mean i don't know it probably just depends on the individual influencer i'm some sure some of them sort of farm it out but all of them know about the deal before uh, they do it. Usually, I know it personally as just like a person on the internet uh, who's gotten offers of brand deals. You just you just always look at it before you say yes. So as far as like, it doesn't really matter to me in so sort of culpability. I'm not saying you ask that. You asked about like, who do you actually think did it? The answer is, yeah, I, I guess I do leave that ambiguous. I, I don't exactly know if he's the one who touched the button at that particular time. And interestingly, that actually becomes hard so i've talked to a few people um you know sometimes my videos will get some like attention of people in law enforcement and mm -hmm. uh i've wondered openly and complained very openly about why there isn't more prosecution of this stuff 
And I've talked to a few people who, who know about this stuff and, and they say one of the hard things is exactly that. You know, it's one thing that this person did it, but if they didn't press the button, you know, how, how can you prove that they're ultimately the person who sold at that day? How do you know that? Even if you've tied a wallet to them from one transaction, how do you know 100% beyond a shadow of the, a doubt that it was them? It's, it's hard, hard to get that last like inch of proof, I guess. You can get the first 99 yards, but then the last one's tough. Yeah. And with like Sam Bankman 3, for example, it feels like, and I guess for all of them, that degree where the last 1% is a, a plausible deniability, even if it's a highly implausible, I still think yeah. it wouldn't be enough to protect them. But it's it, it it's like if I were them, I would get someone else to to do it, just uh, like to create at least some layer. But it's it, it, the fact that it's in so many cases like so straightforward to do, and it is tied to like people tweeting and immediately. Yeah. A thing happening, it it does seem like the circumstantial evidence stacks up. Well, it's hard also to to like talk to. I mean, how do you pitch this to a jury, right? Jury of your peers when most uh, most people do not understand crypto. It's kind of hard. You're going to talk about a a dex. What's a dex? Oh, it's a decentralized exchange. Okay, thanks. You've explained nothing. Oh well, it's just it's just a liquidity pool. You replace the market maker with a liquidity pool. Well, what the hell is a liquidity pool? It's like, well, okay, there used to be market makers. Now we use automated market. Makers. It's like every single thing is like stacked layers of terms and terminology you have to explain. And you have to explain then, now that you understand all that terminology, how that terminology can be used to scam you five ways to Friday, right? Um, so it, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty tough. In the case of SBF, I did want to say, I mean, I, I think the evidence is quite overwhelming. Um, in that case, I, I don't know if you guys saw, he got arrested today. Yeah. And they just released the seal on the like SEC documents and CFTC documents. And it's, it's pretty clear. Yeah. And I, there's, there's also the notion that, you know, in contrast to that point, that when I, you, I think your videos do a really good job, by the way, of like going through technical aspects in a straightforward way. Like the fact that I can follow them is an indicator of that but the, thank you very much the other part is that even with that you know all all those parts about liquidity pools and and you know other wallets and and that it might be difficult for juries to follow the technical details it the part that is really clear to me is one when i see the people the like online figures or celebrities or or like ceos talking the way that they talk is really, really similar to the gurus that we cover. And like when they're asked direct questions, their tendency to, you know, kind of be able to just fluff around, like it kind of almost like dancing, waving their yeah. hands. And yeah. they're using technical terms, but it's the exact same as like when Eric Weinstein is using uh, like mathematical terms or Jordan Peterson is using psychology terms. So in that point, it seems to me that like, a lot of it is rhetoric, and the the one that is coming to mind is, um, I was watching one of your investigations. The um, what is it? Moonbase was the safe moon. Safe moon, safe moon. Yes, and uh, the I think it was the Papa character was yeah. talking about evolution, some something as an evolution, and the description was just it. My it was pure sense maker gobbledygook there was nothing there but it just sounded like you know the the dream and it referenced you know like kind of visionary terms and technologies and stuff so that to me seemed that on rhetoric aspects there's a there's a lot of overlap with your kind of classical guru figures or even you know cult leader types yeah i didn't i i think it's really interesting how you don't actually have to be that sophisticated to appear sophisticated to the um, unfamiliar, the uninitiated, I guess you would say. I mean, you could absolutely not know what you're talking about, about like in the case of crypto, especially. And, and you can just blast people with jargon and uh, just blow them away with nothing, with absolutely nothing insightful to say. Um, 
And I think that's what's been interesting is all the big guys in crypto this summer specifically, like all blew up. All these guys who by the numbers before this year, you would have thought, oh, they're so smart. They're getting the check boxes from all of the mainstream media. I guess one thing I have to ask you guys, what do you think about how it appears to me like guru figures have figured out ways to capture media? Um, in a way that they're very often not criticized by anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I should say, we talk about very different figures. I don't know much about uh, Eric or, or Jordan, but mm. uh, well, actually, besides the fact that my 3D artist hates Jordan Peterson, that's yeah. like all I know is like he despises <laughs> Jordan. But, um, <laughs> but besides that, but I, but I have found that generally these people are very mainstream, ap appealable until they're exactly not, till they're anathema, but mm. until then they're very loved. Yeah. Well, actually, I was watching your coverage of Andrew Tate, and I think you made a point that applies perfectly well to a lot of the characters we look at, which is that these people, one way or another, stumble upon a recipe for attracting attention and then... Once they have the spotlight on them, they can then use that to promote themselves more. And the attention gathering stuff is usually something terribly controversial and gets a lot of um, polarized opinion on both sides. And then once they have the floor, they can then speak to stuff that indicates their access to, to, to secret or not secret, but, but deep and meaningful information that that people could benefit from. Sometimes it's very bland and boring, like Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life is a very bland and boring uh, self-help book sure. to a large degree, a little bit like you were saying about Andrew Tate's training courses. It's just bog standard. Um, yeah, you don't even know how to judge it. You're like, what am I like? And like, I, I know in the case of, T well, I know, okay, I, I don't know nothing about Jordan Peterson. I know he's like clean your room guy. Like you can't say no to that. You're like, all, all right, yeah, sure. I, I don't know if this is one of the rules to life if you had to pick 12, but okay, like, clean your room. Okay, that's fine, <laughs> I guess. Mm. Um, it's it's almost so milk toast that it's uncriticizable. That's yeah. what's so strange about it. But, but then they'll throw in some like wild stuff. I mean, that was like the thing with Tate. He would say something that sounds reasonably plausible. And then he's like, yeah, men should cheat. Women aren't allowed to. And you're like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Where did we, how did we get here? Yeah, you didn't. You know, it's very strange. Uh, but people will look at the reasonable stuff and they'll go, well, he's a pretty normal guy. Like, what are you talking about? Why do you disagree you should make your bet? Yeah. You're like, yeah. No. I think a lot of our gurus play the same Mott and Bailey um, uh, technique. Um, but I mean, perhaps a figure that sits somewhere in between both worlds is Elon Musk. I, I hadn't thought about Elon. Oh, I, you know, I would actually love to hear y'all's thoughts about this. Actually, <laughs> I, actually, I'm fascinated by Elon Musk because... Anyways, I go back and forth on him. I'm like, well, well, first of all, you 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 built these incredible companies. I say the quotes because did he build them? Okay, but he kind of did. He he kind of took like they weren't. Yes, he took over Tesla from two other guys, but you know he kind of did make it what it really is. I mean, he it's it's one thing to have a good idea, but to execute is hard. Um, and then you know he's got a few ideas which seem pretty cool spacex really is doing things uh and then you see what he's doing with twitter and you're like oh this guy's an idiot <laughs> and you see what he's doing with hyperloop and you're like oh this guy's a con man so it's really hard to tell like is this guy just the best salesman and 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 part of his pitch is that he's really smart i mean what is it yeah well we've been i hadn't thought about elon musk at all until we are intending to cover him for uh, the end of our season of gurus uh, this was oh, before. I didn't mean to spoil. No, no, spoilers are good. Um, but um, we've, we actually know something about him. Um, and he's interesting. I was actually reading about Elon Musk in a very dry investment type publication that I subscribed to. And they were making the point that um, a company like Tesla spends nothing on advertising, um, which is very unusual for a band oriented company like that. Right. Um, and Elon Musk's antics and his stage performances um, really, is, they're making the point, like they don't care about Elon Musk. They're not fanboys, they're not haters, but they're making the point that he's worth like a billion dollars in free advertising to the company. And, and I, Absolutely. 
And I think that's the best way to understand him because it's if you just stop for a moment and do a bullshit reality test, it's absolutely ridiculous to think that any one person is making a substantive engineering contribution to both rocket science and brain surgery. And yet that is literally... And electric cars. And yeah, yeah, it goes on, of course. Yet that is the yeah, implication. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, yeah, I like you, I give him credit for definitely being at the helm, you know, being... Um, being in that position but you know uh, everyone has different jobs in a company i'd say his job is getting out there maintaining confidence getting getting investment ensuring the investment money keeps flowing keeping that share price going up um so yeah it doesn't feel like too much of a contradiction to me yeah and the one thing i the hyperloop loop does seem like a contradiction to me i'm sorry chris go ahead oh no no oh, yeah. well it was it was probably a very similar point actually because i was I was going to say that whenever Matt raised that point with me about the advertising now, I, I could see the benefit. But like when we initially looked at his content, right, some of the guru figures that we cover are extremely bombastic and, and they're like, in some respect, the nefarious characters are the most interesting to cover because they're so cartoonish in a way, right? That, and, and the ones that are a little bit arch are also interesting because they're doing something unusual. But Elon was different because his delivery was not very gripping like it was quite dry and his personality didn't seem in the same you know to kind of match the the kind of attention that he's able to get his claims were very big but it it was drier than i expected and then i started you know i think a lot of people go on this journey of checking Finding him, okay, he's, you know, somebody that has like a vision for the future and is motivated by these ideas. And he might be exaggerating slightly, but, you know, it's he, he seems like, you know, reasonably not a terrible person. And then you look into the claims and you find out he says the same thing every year and it's and or that he's on stage holding a solar panel saying this is the real technology and it's like a plastic thing right which he knows is a plastic thing you realize wow that's like a, he's a he's a trump in level able to like lie boldfacedly and and that to me struck as like he's he's kind of interesting because he really is like the ultimate hype man for the companies and the the thing that is striking me looking at his content is like that he lies and it's so easily demonstrated as a lie and so often, but it doesn't it doesn't dent right. things. That's that's the surprising thing for me, is like it doesn't seem to matter. You can demonstrate that what he said isn't true, but it doesn't it, it normally that takes people down eventually, but it it doesn't with him. There's this really interesting thing that I've noticed happen. It's like a I, I don't know how to identify it, but you came the closest in just describing the phenomenon where someone gets a a sort of cult of personality around them that becomes immune. Like it's like almost like they're inoculated from any criticism uh, of a certain like variety. Sometimes they get taken down in very orthogonal ways you wouldn't have expected by some other scandal that has nothing to do with them lying, but it ends up like really hurting their reputation. But Essentially, if you can go long enough lying and the lies are not core to your like your appeal, then somehow even lies that might be core to your appeal end up getting written off as like all the like if you can just convince people that you have haters and people just don't like. Yeah. You. But not for reasons because they're just when they're saying you're lying, it's because they're trying to find reasons they don't like you. They're just hating you because you're successful. Or you're this or you're that. Then it's easy for your little in group to be like, oh, well, we're just not going to listen to that because, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And for Musk, the core thing, I guess, is like, oh, well, he has Tesla and he has Starlink. So, so unless you can prove to me that Starlink and SpaceX and those guys like aren't doing what they're say saying they're doing, then I'll believe you. But, you know, and sometimes the claims come close, like. The Tesla stuff hasn't lived up to the autopilot hype ever, uh, but it kind of is a thing. It, like, like I've ridden, ridden in a Tesla that was, you know, automatic. It is pretty cool. 
it is pretty fast. So it's like almost does it. And so it's it's hard. Yeah, he's he's a confusing figure because there, you know, as you say, there there are real technologies, there are real businesses um amongst his suite. Yeah. Um there are other ones like Hyperloop, which just seem to be nonsensical. And I would crazy. I would include Neuralink with that. Um, I, ha- I happened to do my PhD um, in cognitive neuroscience and was working on a topic that was very closely connected to brain computer interface uh, research. So I-, I paid special attention to that. And I think I was uh, in a way that I can't do with rocket science or how plausible it is to put a m- Mars base in the next few years. I mean, the way he talks about that is he's either lying or he has a childish childlike science fiction understanding i think it has to be that it reminds me of theranos i mean like actually like it reminds me of to the uninitiated in blood science you go oh we've been doing this crude thing where we draw this blood that sucks we're technology just advances so people just have this naive assumption of technology it's like oh just like over time we will naturally just grab more things off the tree of knowledge and like it will always progress towards the sci-fi so it was just the idea was yeah doesn't it sound great that you're in your room and we just don't have to draw so much blood and we get all the information and it's painless it's like yeah that sounds great except all the people in the room who were who were what do they call it uh it's a word for like a doctor who deals in blood like thrombol i forget oh yeah um anyways if you're one of those people a lot of them didn't buy it they thought oh this is absurd but they weren't the ones who had all the the air in the room all the person with all the oxygen was elizabeth holmes and then the rest is history. But in in his case, I don't think he'll ever go down because he'll just, you know, pivot to the next like thing. But I absolutely agree with you. Ever since Neuralink came out, I've been like thinking to myself, there's no way it's this easy. Yeah, that Matt, Matt was talking to me about his description. And, you know, the, like that if the description applied, it would involve like... A, the way to recharge the battery would involve like heating up the implant inside the brain, right? Which is just, that's not something that you want. It's not people, something you do. You, you, you don't want a hot thing inside your brain. There's no, there's no nerve cells there to stimulate pain, but you know, cooking your brain is just generally, even I know that's a bad, a bad idea. So I've got a question for you guys. So what's interesting to me is like thinking, um, like on the one hand, I'm fascinated by the individual. On the other hand, I'm fascinated by the systems that allow them to occur. So in the case of Elon, a lot of it is that the venture world lionizes people who lie until they don't. Like it's like actually part of the job description is you have to be a basically a storyteller until you get enough money to make the technology later. And like that's as stupid as it sounds, that's how a lot of companies have been built. So what do you think that's like, doesn't that make us sort of uh, prone to grifters and because those people are great storytellers, right? Like that actually yeah. is one of the hallmarks of a grifter is you, yeah. you really tap into emotion and people's beliefs. Yeah. Well, if we're talking about systems and societies and stepping back to that level, uh, I've got a couple of things to say. I guess, firstly, in a way, like t- technology and science is real. It delivers real benefits. But in the popular imagination, it can still occupy the same kind of place in their minds as as religion and magic did in the old days. And just like a traditional shaman would um, basically say to an audience that they are in touch with powerful forces beyond their audience's understanding, and they have a conduit, and they can deliver the good things and save us from the bad things. Um, there is a place for people to do that, whether it's crypto or a venture capitalist. Um, the other thing, too, and looking at these um, other gurus, is, is some of them have very strong links with the very apex of the of the corporate power food chain, you know. And it is amazing to us that these, you know, blue chip top executives of these blue chip companies will pay large amounts of money to these people to clearly speak utter bullshit to them, you know, flatter them and just just talk nonsense to them. So the people running the world are not quite as smart as we might hope. And so I'm, I don't have 
strong um, sort of economic political opinions one way or another, but it, it did give me a little bit of a crisis of confidence in capitalism, which is based on the <laughs> idea of efficient allocation of capital. Um, but maybe that's just the price you pay for, um, you know, um, corp- you know, um, economics and changing technologies coexisting. There's always the human element, and we're all just primates in suits in the end. I don't know. There's a there's a we we talked with Manvir Singh, somebody who studies shamanism and and about the connections and disconnections, you know, between uh, traditional shamans and and the guru figures that we cover and he he noted a whole bunch of parallels and like matt said you can almost treat anything any topic if you obfuscate enough as if it's like a mystical realm that you can go into and extract you know the the science from even real science right like what what Theranos was promising it was like it was science fiction but it was close enough to actual technology that people could, like you said, kind of get a handle around it. And, you know, um, in the content that you covered, when especially when you were looking at celebrity figures and their endorsements, right? It, it feels that there's, it's very hard and it may, probably impossible to get people not to transfer the admiration they have for a celebrity or an influencer in one area into like the financial product or the cryptocurrency that they're hawking, right? And that's the exact same reason like Hollywood stars have been selling, wearing watches and you can't do it. You, you're not going to be able to ever really uh, remove that element from people's like psychology. But the part that, and, and as depressing as that is, the part that I saw in your video when you talked about, you know, looked at the celebrity cryptocurrencies and or how they're doing or the NFTs, and they're all down, through, like with a handful of exceptions. But they made, there is the initial like uh, hype period, right? So the celebrities make money and, and some, some f- investors are making money, but the majority of people don't. And it, it's the same as Matt said, like, Watching that, you just you, it. It is hard not to become cynical about like there's no there's no solution because humans are we're not we're good we're like built to be exploited by people and people are getting better at it. So that's a pessimistic part. The but, solution yeah. is you call them out and you shame the people who are doing it, but that's about all you can do. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it's it's no use trying to like wag your finger finger at people. Because the real problem is, is that, you know, 80% of people, well, I, this is not a hard stat. I shouldn't cite figures that I have absolutely no basis for. But um, there's some figure of people who they get scammed the first time and it's kind of like a shock to their system. Like, oh, I won't do that again. And then there's sort of a smaller percentage that are repeat offenders. But both of those people, you can't really help. You can't really help the naive person who's never been scammed in an industry before who will never get scammed again. And it's hard to help the person who's, consistently getting scammed because there's usually something in the psychology, whether it's desperation or whether it's just a perpetual belief that in the next person, it, it's kind of like hard to parse that. So what I realized is, okay, I'm not going to try to talk. Um, and also oftentimes it's like, it's useless to to try to like shame victims. It makes no sense. So it's better to just go after the people responsible for this and just basically call it out, call the behavior out and try to, try to create negative incentives where there previously were none. So in the case of influencers, these people are happy to scam people right until it affects their relationship with their audience. Now you're touching their pocket. And so then they go, oh man. So I've actually seen a lot of these guys, after I'll call them out, like they'll start disclosing ads. They'll start saying, okay, this was an ad. I will admit it, guys. Or they'll stop promoting crypto altogether. I mean, There was actually an interesting phase where everyone was producing their own crypto coins. And largely that stopped. A lot of people now do NFTs. And then we called that out for a while. And like they do like less. And it wasn't just me. It was like the whole community had started being like, hey, this is really scammy. This is really strange. So I don't know. It's sort of like a grift cycle where they just find something new. I mean, this is just the state of perpetual state of grifters. And I'm sure it'll go back to that. Before I got involved with crypto, it was something called an ICO, the initial coin offering. There's just always something new way to extract money that they're inventing. And crypto just happens to be a very convenient one. 
But I think regulation is coming. And with that, things will get better. Although it won't feel that way. If there's anything I've noticed, like it always viscerally feels like it's the worst, but it's, but it's, and it will get better. Yeah, it probably will get better. But just like there were tulips before and now there's bitcoins and there'll be something, some new flashy thing, I suppose. Yeah, I don't mean to be like naively optimistic about just like it'll always get better. That's not true necessarily, but, uh, you know. Yeah. It also doesn't help to just be cynical and be like, okay, well, then what's the point of doing any of this? No, no, you have to. You have to. That's right. No, no, sorry. I didn't mean to sound negative. I mean, you you have to, uh, you know, and society does adapt to the current strains of misinformation out there and um, but it's a cycle that continues. I wanted to ask you really quickly, um, you're familiar with, um, I don't know how to pronounce it, Ruja Ignatova, the crypto queen? Is that someone you've come across? A little bit familiar with her. Yeah, one coin, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Well, if you're not super familiar with her, I maybe won't um, ask this question. But I, I, I only consumed the, the the BBC series on that phenomena, and it was fascinating because on one hand, it was purportedly crypto. There was there was no crypto in it. It was they had a database that just kept <laughs> like, a, like a Excel spreadsheet that kept track. It's fa- it's fascinating. It's like almost like the crypto doesn't even matter. It's yep. a vehicle to communicate the message. It, this isn't okay. So. Th- you're actually getting to a really interesting point, Matt. I, I forget, there was some, uh, gosh, what was the name of it? It was like, it was some Bitcoin mining scheme, okay? And when I heard about this, I thought, oh, this is genius. It probably made tons of money. And sure enough, it made like hundreds of millions. But basically they told people, you just, ba- basically what you have to, so everyone knows, oh, if it's too good enough to be true, it probably is too good. Um, it doesn't exist. But it's a huge caveat. If you can convince people with a plausible enough reason to pass their like their doubt, their bullshit meter, if you can convince them of like some way that too good to be true could be true, people are dying to believe you. They're dying. They're like, we'll line up. So the scheme was this. They told people that they had. So mining Bitcoin was starting to become popular in like 2016, 2017, 2018. But it started to get too expensive. Like the electricity wasn't mm. worth the cost of the GPU and the cost to run it. The, but so these people said, hey, we're buying miners in Iceland where because of the geothermal energy, the energy is cheaper there. And so we can run these at this huge profit. So you just buy a Bitcoin miner from us and we will go buy a Bitcoin, like a GPU and we'll mine Bitcoin. This is brilliant because who's going to fly out to Iceland and check that they actually have the stupid miners? But like, so so I just thought, oh, this made hundreds of millions. And yeah, sure enough, it made hundreds of millions. Basically, the point is, is that if you have a good enough vehicle to convince people as a grifter, if you have a good enough like kind of story, it's kind of, it always has to have some kind of wild twist to it that sounds like a little implausible, but like maybe it's true. And yeah, it's crazy. You can just take people's money for free. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because that was where I was going with that question, which is that the the technical details of mm, SpaceX or Neuralink or crypto is, is interesting, sure, and we could talk about the validity behind it, but I think what you said is true, which is like in terms of the at the psychological level, in terms of the appeal, the the substrate doesn't matter. What what you need is is the whole is, is a good story, a plausible story and uh because people want to believe, you know, this is this is scams and snake oil salesmen been around since forever. And like, <sighs> how how are we going to stop having hope? There's no way to um, sort of yeah, fix that. Yeah, yeah, because it's kind of hard. You you go like you become the bad guy, like for calling it out. You're like, hey, this guy's scamming you. They're like, how dare you take away my hope? You're like, I didn't. Well, I don't want to take away your hope. You just it's a bad thing to hope it. Um, yeah, th- you know, I wanted to say something about that. What's maybe interesting about crypto, why it's a particularly virulent scamming substrate is that A, it's just a currency itself, which is interesting. It's a direct investment. You get in it that way. But I also noticed something my t- in my time looking at MLMs that maybe you guys have seen before. There's a, you almost need an amount of complexity that's hard to penetrate. Like that's too opaque to really get into. So when you go into MLMs, there's always these impossibly complicated like pyramids and ladders. It's like 
you would think that, oh, like make it simple, keep it simple, stupid, just like be like, you know, mm -hmm. just a straight up pyramid. But no, it's always some weird leg system and there's always some strange compensation structure that is not straightforward and it's not easy to parse out like what you're actually going to get paid. But this complexity actually helps you kind of surrender to the bigger system because you go, well, somebody above me has it figured out. And of course they don't. And I think crypto is great at this. It's great at, hey, well, it's just this magic bean counting system anyways like uh, obviously somebody made money and sure they did uh, but it doesn't mean you're going to the, there's a nice analogy that like springs to mind that um that probably crypto people wouldn't like but you know the traditional religious cosmologies there's you know there's the monotheistic like there's god at the top and that, that's straightforward right but like actually almost all religions have these very, very complex cosmologies where they've got, you know, demigods and angels and different classes of angels. And if you look at like a uh, Buddhist Tanka painting, you can see all these different categories of beings and, you know, alternative worlds and so on. And the complexity is, seems to be intoxicating, right? Like people like to think about there's this knowledge which is esoteric. And that you can master if you, you know, if you devote enough time to it. But there are people more competent to understand how these things connect together. And it can be, it can have any kind of skin on it. So it can be like supernatural beings in all these different realms, or it can be financial systems and uh, cryptocurrencies and NFTs, or it can be, you know, when it comes to Scientology, how to progress up the self-actualization and become clear. So I, I think you're really hitting on something that giving people the sense that there's this super complex system and that you as a, a guru figure or like a master, you know, uh, like CEO has, can give them the guide to navigate that. That's like a really powerful narrative that it's, and it, it you know, and there's lots of occasions where that is also a narrative that applies in an actual thing where there are people with expertise and they teach you how to do something I was about to, better. I was about to bring that up too. Like, yeah, the, the, what's so challenging is that sometimes there is that like thing. I mean, I like I play jazz piano and it's incredibly complicated. Like mu the music theory behind it is very complicated. And usually I'm like, I'll get confused. And at one point, because I taught myself how to play, but eventually I got a professor at a local community college to give me private lessons. And it's like opening a door. It's like he knew all this stuff that really kind of was like locked away knowledge. It wasn't, um, you know, I had read books about it, but it was like something about having a guy sit there and kind of explain it, it was really helpful. Um, but yeah, so, yeah, so th this is the hard thing about grifters is usually what makes them so successful is they're pulling on something which is like real usually. They're, or they're, they're, they're drawing power from something that is true. Like uh, the Andrew Tate figure. He's talking about, oh, the world's messed up. Yeah, from a certain perspective, the world is messed up. Like you can draw a lot of power from that narrative. You can draw a lot of power from the narrative. Oh, you know, as men, you haven't been spoken to. I think that's like probably a Jordan Peterson narrative too, right? Like, you know, disaffected young men. You feel lost. You feel like you don't have a strong role model in your life. Yeah, this is a powerful narrative. And then just kind of comes everything else. It's like then they sell you something on the side. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. The anti-establishment, uh, like pose is, is also really powerful. And, you know, in, in your interview with Lex, I heard you talk about the fact that, you know, people are, were rightly, uh, like disenchanted with the traditional financial systems, right? Because they saw what happened with the wall street collapse and all of those, uh, the, all of the various systems and, and Ponzi schemes and so on that go on. So institutions. And, and traditional financial systems did seem to be screwing people over. And it's it, it's not an unwarranted conclusion to draw that like decentralized uh, currencies, which are not tied to like banks and governments would be would be better and, and could be this emancipatory force. And that's what in part makes it so much worse. Yeah. That they, they, they then go on to screw the exact same people in a like a new way <laughs> yeah yeah there's always a, there's always a boot unfortunately 
Um, some people just wanted to be the new boot. The people who were really smart wanted to be the new boot. Some people thought it would get rid of the boot altogether. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's fascinating. We, um, there was a, there was a point that I just wanted to talk about. Um, what were you saying right before the crypto stuff? Oh, about establishment figures. I'm dying to talk about this. So I read this book called like the death of expertise by Tom Nichols, I think. Um, a good book. But it basically talks about how people are increasingly losing trust in um, like trusted systems. And it's kind of like generic on purpose. That could be the NIH, the, the health system. There's all this disagreement about like, are these people lying to us? And never before in my life had there been like these big questions. Um, what do you think is causing that? Do you think that is like a largely a social media emergent phenomenon or do you think, what do you think it is? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's a, a real thing that's going on. The death of expertise is, is linked strongly to the uh, conspiracism and the anti-establishment stuff that Chris was talking about. Those things go together. Um, so you'll see otherwise relatively normal people sort of say in a cavalier way that all the virologists out there and all the universities are, are corrupted by the perverse incentives and they, they, they can't say what they really think. Um, when it's just so clearly implausible, it requires a conspiratorial frame of mind to believe that. People have certainly always been conspiratorial and probably people have already always you know, had um, raised eyebrows at authority figures. But I guess... I don't know, this is just pure opinion. This is not really well-informed at all. But I guess the sense that I get is that in society generally, since say like the 1950s, that there has been a general, I guess, equalizing and a democratization. So so we don't necessarily look up and respect to, if you live in a small town, the, the, the school teacher and the policeman, the judge or whatever, you know, um, for various reasons, you know, and for some of them are good reasons. So a lot of these people or institutions have shown in some respects to have uh, feet of clay. Um, but that's that's a real thing on, over on top of the social media effects, which just allows people to share their conspiracism and to, to focus on the stories that make institutions look bad. I think it's quite interesting that if you look at American politics at the moment, it's quite different in where Chris is and where I am. But it does. It's interesting to me in telling that it's like both sides of politics. Like you can have the you can have extremely obviously the right wing Trumpian type QAnon people think the entire system, right, is 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 corrupt. But if right. you look at the bleeding edge of of left wing online discourse, in a way, it's not so similar, right? They would they would say the They're entire similar. thing. They are similar. Yeah. No, so like, yeah. Yeah. Um, you said not so similar, but you meant similar. I meant so, not yeah, so, not so not dissimilar, dissimilar yeah, is yeah, what yeah. I meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So you know, I feel like it's a real thing that's going on, but that's just a gut feeling, I suppose. Yeah. It, yeah, it has to do. S I'm sorry, Chris. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, 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 my, my thought is still formulating. So uh, please, it's still percolating. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what that is. I mean, yeah, it has to do something with people being able to i think google stuff really quickly it gives the appearance that all knowledge is grasped immediately like that you don't have to work for it there's no kind of knowledge behind a degree you can just look up a study as easily as a doctor can look up a study so you just assume like well yeah i could do my research just as much as this doctor could and there's just this appearance that if i can if i can almost i can basically read an academic study well then i must be on sort of equal footing. And also, so that combined with the fact that it's always the most negative, horrible stories that go viral, you'll never hear like, oh, the FBI did their job today. It's like the FBI did something terrible or our health officials did something terrible. Um, and I think that's really bad. I think you do always have to admit for the sake of just being fair to the conspiracy people, the our officials have sometimes made some horrible miscalculations to lie to the public, thinking that it would just be swept under the rug. And what I find so interesting about events like this is that oftentimes they are swept under the rug, but they have this corrosive long-term cost on the public trust that is not immediately obvious, um, which 
in the long term is very hard. So you you make these short term optics calls, which like sound right immediately, and then long term you pay for really badly. Mm. Mm. That's There's, my thought. Matt, did you want to say I have something? But if you wanted to follow up, yeah, I think you'll probably talk to um, some of those. Yeah, the issues with um, yeah institutions and authority. Uh, figures, you know, do, making own goals essentially to um, decrease trust. I was just thinking in terms of like the bigger scope of it, which is if you look at the arc of um, global history, it, it has been an arc towards increasing democratization and and increasing sort of axiomatic respect for author authority figures. I mean, we literally were ruled by kings and queens who said that they had a mandate from heaven. And there was just no questioning that. Um, so in, in many ways, it's a good thing, right? It's like the flip side of, of what is essentially a good thing, which is a, a democratic culture, which is, hey, I can, I can get in there. I can learn about how ivermectin works or how vaccines work. Um, I can, um, you know, everyone gets a chance, gets a voice. Um, so the internet facilitates it, the technology facilitates it, but we also have a, an egalitarian democratic culture, I suppose, which is a good thing but has an Achilles heel. Yeah, I guess what I want to say is a supplement to that because I think one thing that like uh, people who research conspiracy communities and, and like uh, cults have started to talk about the proliferation of leaderless cults or, or kind of low-cost membership cults. Whereas before, you know, cults could have powerful control over people and they had totalizing ideologies, a charismatic guru figures. There was always the limitation that like, how do you, how do you join a cult? You got to go somewhere and, you know, you've got to cut off contact with family and uh, you, you've got to like kind of make these quite strong commitments. So there was always limitations and sure you could recruit a lot of people for certain cults and the, you know the barrier between religion and cult whatever but now that's not the case right now it's very very easy for people to surf between gurus and between communities online and the cost mm. is often just the cost of watching their youtube video or you know or maybe joining a patreon or or something like that and that mm. that is resulting in like a different dynamic but a lot of the same forces like applying to people's psychology. And I also think in my lifetime that I was always interested in conspiracism and like uh, kind of pseudoscientific communities. And that used to be this fringe topic that, you know, HIV, AIDS, denialism was a thing, but really most normally people would never come across it. And there were some counterexamples like the South African government, the health minister, became convinced in it and it had terrible consequences but it wasn't something you would hear most mainstream politicians talk about and that's completely changed especially with covid now you know it, donald trump is an obvious example but now conspiracism is just everywhere and it it's it's so depressing because it does make you know the kind of thing that matt and me are interested in more relevant uh, you know you could you could offer take some things but the downside is wish that wasn't. we really wish it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like Chris, I was studying um, vaccine skepticism, the, the psychology of vaccine hesitancy and stuff like that. Just just graduated a PhD student a few days ago, actually. It was the ceremony. Yes. And um, we've been studying it for years. And it really was like a niche a niche topic in health psychology. Not niche anymore. You picked a good, <laughs> a good field to go into right now. Yeah. Um, you know what's weird is... They, so, so what's always fa what always fascinated me about so what originally sort of got me interested in scams was like like uh, watching my mom because she's always into some like health scam and quackery and she's still like to some extent the day I was coming like I came home she's like do you really get these like vaccine like I don't know about that vaccine right <laughs> and I'm like have you been like listening to Sean Hannity or something and she's she's like well and I was like all right you gotta you gotta unplug you <laughs> um, but. But that always got me interested in it because when I started like looking at like really studying these people, what I realized is all their message came from, you know, hey, look at all the terrible things the big pharma has done. And in a way, it's like easy because big pharma has a long history to draw from. They have a lot of stakeholders. There's tons of blame that's fairly assigned to them. Okay. 
But then they go, okay, buy my product. Well, who are you? Well, we have no history on you. You're a nobody that came from, you know, Tennessee. You have no credentials. Or maybe you even have some, I, I don't know. But you then promise the world. And because you don't have any skeletons under your closet, you buy in, right? And then what they sell you is worse than what Big Pharma was going to sell you in most cases. And the worst thing about that is like, then when they go down, they don't they don't have a long history. They don't get a stain on the record. They just disappear and another grifter pops up and takes their place. Mm. Or they hide it or, you know, they have all these uh, mechanisms. But I wanted to go back to something Matt said that I thought was really interesting, which I like thought, like, you hit on one side of the coin and I think it's interesting to take the other. So you talked about, you know, oh, we used to have kings where we had like this axiomatic trust in them. And now we've democratized knowledge, which is true. Also true is that there's an increasingly, as we gain more knowledge, it becomes increasingly impossible to know enough about any field to be even just reasonably knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. Like it's just like so specialized. So we have all these sort of miraculous technologies in our life that we just sort of trust, yep. which usually isn't a problem because they just do the things they do. My phone just, I don't, you don't really don't have, don't have to trust it at all, but like you're getting on an airplane. Okay. That's a little different. I, I, I trust those Boeing engineers, but I don't know them. All right. I trust that they probably did their homework, but I, I don't really know. Um, but then when you go to something like vaccines that I think that's where it like really, I think that's why it's such a, that's like where that rubber really meets the road is yeah. when you don't need the trust for so much of life mm. because we've democratized knowledge. Yeah. At the same time, there's some things that are so incredible, like mRNA vaccines. It was incredible to me. The number of virologists in my life, I suddenly found myself with. Everyone's a virologist <laughs> with an expertise in mRNA. I said, you didn't know what mRNA meant last week. How are you an expert now? And they're like, I'm telling you. You know, it, it's it's insane to me, but but people spend their lifetime understanding this technology and it's like, yeah, it, it blows me away. But I think it does have some, it has to have something to do with that fact yep. that y if you don't have that underlying trust in institutions and you're just relying on yourself, I mean, it's impossible to learn about these technologies mm. in a reasonable way. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. There's like, you know, three distinct things that are different today than a few hundred years ago. Yeah. Yes, communication technologies reduces the friction. Um, just, just so like high frequency trading, high frequency mimetic transfer happens <laughs> so quickly. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I think the democracy, the culture, cultural stuff there is, is one thing. But like you said, the other thing that's fundamentally different is that our our technological landscape in which we inhabit is just vastly more complex than. Uh, a couple of hundred years ago, and it is just not possible. You have to take, you have to learn to take things on trust. Yet, I think the the information that's available to us on the internet actually encourages to do encourages us to do the opposite. Oh, I'm going to do my own research on climate change or something. And and one of the things that Chris and I try to encourage people is to say, that don't do that for fuck's sake. Do not do your own research. What you should be thinking about is how how do I decide who are the right sources to trust. So even myself, I, I know how to use Google Scholar. I, I'm a statistician. I understand about research methods. I can do a passable job at looking at a yeah. randomized control trial. But why the hell would I? What I should be doing is is read good meta-analyses, good summary articles, also published in the literature. And I can easily, without much, without like, fuck, I was amazingly bewildered by how complex the human immune system is. <laughs> we, we saw some introductory material. I went, wow, this is... So that's not what you want to do, is it? What you need to do is learn how to read critically um, sources that are providing high-level summaries. And I guess I'm still a little bit baffled. I mean, we've had people on the show, we're a bit stuck on vaccines, we'll get off it. But we, we've had virologists on, like like professors at, at Oxford, at, at King's College London, places like that. With 30 years history, like working in labs, like, you know, doing, doing research on vaccine and viruses. Um, why don't people just listen to them? Why the hell are you listening to some rando who's parachuted into this topic last week? So not the current zeitgeist. <laughs> <That's like, laughs> yeah. I can feel that screw up in people's bones. I think, I think for, I think part of it is that in some ways the naive amateur is better able to talk in the naive amateur's language. So they mm. talk to the issues that the naive amateur sort of thinks about. 
Like they're like, oh yeah, like this. And 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 they will talk to the issues that a naive anim- amateur can quickly reach to. Whereas an expert won't even think about it. It's not even like in their realm of thought because it's so far in the undergrad world or it's even, even oh, I thought about that when I was like a grad student, but like then there's this and this reason and they just take it all for granted. So it becomes, in some ways, sometimes being an expert makes it hard to teach in a strange way because you like forget what it's like to be a novice. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's what it is. There just also is a mega problem on the internet where, um, and this is Chris brought this up, where everyone should have an opinion about everything. We were talking a bit before the show about your galaxy brain like thing. That was so funny because it's it's this is my number one issue. I used to I used to have a podcast. I still I still go drop in occasionally, and I stopped it for a variety of reasons. But um, I was losing time. But one of the reasons, which always annoyed me, was. I'd be forced into talking. We'd be talking for two hours and we kind of were just like talking with a buddy. But we talk about all these pop culture issues that I have no idea about. And I was just like giving opinions, like just like giving hot takes. And I realized, oh, it's kind of strange because I have this platform where I'm very thoughtful and like I like actually know what I'm talking about usually. Um, And then I'm like giving like these hot takes that I'd be giving at a bar or something. But I have an audience now. This audience, I mean, I mean, I'm sure they don't actually think that I'm any uh, really that smart, but they might take me as seriously with those things as they take me with these others. So I think that's a huge problem. I think some people exploit that, like natural trust in the people you've listened to on one thing, you listen to them on others. But I think we've, I'm sure this is probably a lot of what y'all talk about. We've seen so many people who they're studying one field, they are an expert in one field, and they be then they actually make their career talking about something completely different. There's there's so many good good points there, and there's there's one thing that I noticed in your interview with Lex. We we have various criticisms that we might uh, which we should have leveled at, at Lex, but in you know it's normal at the end of a podcast where people ask you you know to give some big thoughts or this kind of thing, right? And at the end of the interview, Lex asked you about what advice you would give to young people, right? And the interesting thing for me was you you started um, giving advice and, you know, I would like hesitant to do so, but then we're saying, okay, you know, maybe don't give up when people say you can't do something and, and stuff like this. But what struck me was in the middle of giving that advice, you said, y- you know what, this this sounds corny and like, I don't know, I don't know, you know, and the, but there was a feeling there that that self-consciousness about giving, you know, advice is something that, when we look at guru figures, they don't have that. They're willing, if someone asks them, what do you think about this? They'll just launch off and they'll usually find some way to like claim expertise about such a wide variety of subjects. And people like yourself, and I genuinely mean this, I, and, and other people that we, we cover and, and relevant experts are often hesitant. And as a, as a result of that, it's what you said that the people who can kind of do the science cosplay, they're often willing to overstate their expertise and stuff. They look more certain and confident, whereas the experts look like people that are a little bit, you know, they're not that sure of themselves and they, they add too many caveats and academics waffle too much like we do. And it, it it's you can't compete with somebody who is an incredibly loquacious guru yeah. who will over exaggerate their expertise so uh yeah i'm not i'm not calling you out by the way i mean genuinely that that was one of the things that was i really wanted to talk to you um uh about i i'd love to talk about that. you know it's funny so i had a whole people probably don't know this um i did have a self-improvement phase in my life at like 18 or like and i feel like most people do they read yeah. a few of self-help books they go oh this is this is a game changer ha <laughs> I'm never going to have to, I'm going to, my whole life's going to change. Um, and to some extent, you take some high level principles that might be useful. But um, one interesting thing was I had uh, my brother, we'd always like talk to each other about these like various ideas. And we'd always be like, hey, I've got, I had, I found this new idea, that changed my life. And we'd always say that like, oh, I got this one idea that changed my life. It's going to change everything. And then, and then, uh, I'd say that and then my brother would be like, whoa, wait, hold on. You can say that in a second, but I got one idea that's going to change your life. And it was like, we at first were kind of saying it like half sincerely. And then we started laughing because by our nature, just talking to each other, we were like very like confident and whatever. 
Uh, but we started to like have this meta realization of what we were doing. So now we have this joke like, hey, I've got this one idea that's going to change your life. But it's like the joke is it never changes your life. Like it's so. And so I kind of got some, you know, early experience just uh, just like with my brother, with friends of just the the ludicrousness of just one piece of advice that will change your life. I think it's it's so stupid. I mean, when you actually experience life, you realize how absurd this is. You live a little little bit. Um, but yeah, it, it's funny how viral that is and how much it obsesses us that solutions could be simple. It could be just one thing that I have to like. And it's not even that I have to apply it. It's just I have to hear it. It's one thing. It's a piece of advice. Your life will spin on advice. It's yeah. It's very interesting. I think I think that's a good heuristic, um, Chris. You might have to remind me of some of the names of these books. But I'm thinking of books in the vein of Guns, Germs, and Steel, or what are the, some of the more recent ones, which which give, which people read and they go, oh, "That's just changed my entire." Like, now I look at everything, history, humanity, yeah. completely differently. I love the books that they do all of history in one book. It's like, oh, <laughs> that is. That is millennial crack. It's like you. Hey, I only have to read one book to understand everything. Great, yeah. I'll buy it. Yeah. The one you're thinking of, Matt, is "The Dawn of Everything" by <laughs> Van Gogh and Graeber. Yeah. That's a yeah. current yeah. like, if, it, yeah. even if not familiar, you can get a sense just from the title that. And there is this is where you know relatively respectable people go some degree down the guru trail because to to sell a book like that, you you need to promise. A, a breathtaking new vision. You want these easily consumed kind of uh, truthy feeling insights that people feel like that they're getting. And for me, it's become a real red flag. Like I, I, I love you know, I, I, I like consuming content about history and stuff like that. But the stuff that I, I feel is real is the stuff where there's no grand, simple, beautiful narrative that ties it all up in a bow. It's just. You know, here's some crazy shit that happened. I've been listening to the, I keep saying this, the Revolutions podcast um, is, uh, is by the guy to the history of Rome. It's a good example. It's just a good illustrative example. It's because <laughs> yeah. he, he's covered the French Revolution, the Heidi Revolution, the, uh, the Glorious Revolution. Like, yes, there are some broader principles, some broader themes and so on you can, you can pick up, but it's also a complex mess of shit that happened. Mm. And mm. yeah, so for me, I just think that's a good heuristic to, yeah, if, if there's some bit of advice or some, some new way of looking at the world or some technology like, like crypto that is just going to change everything, then you, your warning lights should be going off. Yeah. And there's you, the, there was another uh, point that I heard when, so the, there's been some videos, Matt, if you haven't seen, where uh, CoffeeZilla has uh, spoke to like Sam Bankman Freed directly or other crypto uh, scammers right? or, or people in potentially engaged in scam, whatever way you need to say it, like the, they and, and directly put the criticisms to them. I'm right. So one thing is that people like that, right? That I like that. I enjoy hearing somebody have to respond to uh like direct pointed questions and uh so i do have a question about like how your comfort level with doing that because that's not something that people are typically very comfortable with doing but the the other point i w wanted to ask about before that was so uh lex was discussing the possibility of you know it would if it would be a good idea for him to like, for example, interview Sam Bankman Freed and to like not focus on the technology aspect, but try to get to know the man, right? And the the kind of personal bit. And it struck me that you responded like kind of negatively to that, you know, saying that, well, these people are actually quite good. And I can imagine what they would say in those circumstances. But mm -hmm. that that what Lex was voicing is something that I see a lot and we see it in this sphere that we cover, which is like adjacent to the IDW um, uh, or like heterodox sphere, the sense makers, they're called. And they, they put a really strong premium on interpersonal face-to-face -face discussions that like if you spend multiple hours speaking with someone and you, you are charitable to them, that you'll basically be able to peel back the layers and get to the real human. And... I think that this is an extremely bad heuristic, like because it, it just doesn't account in this for people who are good at presenting themselves in a particular kind of way. But I wonder with the people that you deal with who who do seem experts 
at like managing their image, at presenting and at obfuscation. Like how how do you get past that when you have like limited time to, you know, make questions and also like how much of an issue do you think that is? Like could you have a long extended interview where you, you know, you bury through the psychic defenses to get to the real person? Um, do you think that's more worth doing than I do? Or What's your general yeah, opinion? I, I'd love to. I, I have so many things to respond. I, I, you guys can't see it, but I have like actual like little notepads of like all my little notes here of things I wanted to respond to. There's so much here. Um, okay. All right. Let's, let's start with the Lex sort of last question and then work backwards. Let me start by saying I actually liked Lex Friedman a lot. We talked for like eight hours and I had a great time with it. Okay. Let me just say that up we, front. We were generally um, positive about him. Generally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, like there, there were some things that, uh, which which what you, goes back to what you said, which is like, what is the value in having these conversations? And like Sam Bankman Freed, I, I I just think, especially when you watch his other interviews, it quickly becomes apparent that he's very good at deflecting, even if you know what you're talking. Um, so I felt like I knew what I was talking about, and it took me three interviews to get a really substantive answer out of him, um, where I finally pinned him down and I got him to say something that. I don't think he was comfortable saying, which is why he later got mad at me. Like that was the only time I've seen him sort of crack in an interview. And he's like, you're grandstanding, you're, you're monopolizing this interview. But he had just admitted that he had co-mingled funds. But it took me three interviews. I studied the interviews of other people who had also, I felt, failed. Um, and so basically, I was basically five interviews deep in like trying to chess my way through his all the different techniques he was using. And most of it was obfuscation, gish galloping, moving to different topics while it seems like you're talking about the same thing, but you're not, deflection. It's all these techniques he was using. And, and unfortunately uh, for him, he just had like, he was, I realized if you kind of asked him similar questions, he'd always give the same answer. So then I just like kind of plotted my way through in a way that I'd seen the answers before. So I was like, all right, we're not going to take that path this time. We'll take this other path. And so that was kind of interesting because it, it was a pretty unique experience. Um, but to your point about the value of these things, it's really tough. There, I know what you're talking about. There's this sense that like you can talk to anyone. And obviously we've seen this play out with Kanye. Yeah, I, I really thought it really challenged my belief on this because I think I have a bit of that bias, like, oh, just talk to people. Just talk, just talk to people. What's the problem? Just talk to people. And watching Kanye, I don't think I saw that much productive. I admired some of the some of the interviews. I thought Lex actually tried to challenge him, but did it make a difference with Kanye? I, I he goes on Alex Jones the next day and does the whole like, or I don't think it was the next day. It was like sometime soon after that, and does the crazy, you know, I love, you know, so and so rant. Um, so that was not good. I, I think ultimately, like these are all weighed decisions based on a, do you think this person is coming to you in good faith? Uh, I think most of the time people assume that everyone's talking to them in good faith and it's just like quite frequently not the case. Even if you can have a private conversation in good faith, mm -hmm. it's very rare that you have a public confrontation in good faith. As soon as it becomes confrontational, it, for, for a lot of these guru types, it becomes about optics, it becomes about power, it becomes about win, winning and losing. And knowing that, if you are going to engage in that, you have to understand that they're not going to behave in good faith. And so you need to make sure that like you bring your A game. So one thing that I always try to do is I just like try to be really prepared. I mean, I just try to have facts on my side and just like be like, whoa, wait, you're saying this. Because a lot of times, a lot of times the way these people are pretty cocky, so they think they can kind of talk their way out of anything. But frequently you can't talk your way out of like, I'll usually say something about like, oh, did you say such and such? And they'd be like, no, I didn't say that. And then I'll pull up a clip on like live and like play it. It's just like destroys credibility. I mean, you're gone. Um, but usually I'll do stuff like that. And um, I mean, that's kind of the best way to kind of engage with these people is not let them do that. I don't know. I feel like I'm all over the place. And honestly, I don't feel like I am that good at good at this. I feel like I'm learning. Um, it's not easy. Like you have to be, you have to learn to not be like the, the friendly guy on the call, which is not easy to do. Mm, yeah. And 
I've definitely picked up the skill over time, but I think it's even harder in person. Mm. I think being confrontational, heavily confrontational, which some of these conversations need to be heavily confrontational. Like I think with Kanye, you need to, if you're going to have a conversation with that guy, the only way to do it responsibly is like really confront him, not do the whole like, oh, you seem like you're a good guy. Like you can't. Um, and I think the interpersonal thing, like there's something about that. There's very frequently heavy c confrontation. I think Zoom helps in some ways or like online calls. Mm, it's yeah. easier to be like harder. Yeah, those are really, those are really good points. It's certainly something I've struck myself. I've realized that like a, like a hard-nosed professional journalist is, is a real job with a real role and they go in to deal with a politician who's going to be obfuscating and bullshitting and they're not going out to be their best friend and they, they don't mind if things get awkward and people become unhappy. And, um, you know, that's not, that's not, I'm not good at that. That's not something I ever really <laughs> signed up for. So it's something that I've kind of had to realize that, um, that unless you're up for doing that kind of interview, then sometimes you should say no to some opportunities. But um, I, th I think you are definitely on the way to mastering that particular skill, mate. Um, having said that, I am going to leave you to Christopher's uh, tender mercies. I have to get to my next um, uh, oh, engagement. Oh, sure. Sorry, Matt. It's been great. It's been great talking. Yeah. I. Uh, Oh, you're, you're taking off, right? Yeah, I'm going to take off. Yeah. Did you have any f final thing you want to say to me? I did have one <laughs> last thing. I've been hanging on to this. Okay. And so there's this paper called That's Interesting by Murray Davis, I think. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he his thought is, how do the summary is this. How do theories which are generally consider inter, considered interesting differ from theories which are generally considered non-interesting? And his idea, and this goes back to your point about like what makes a pop book. Yeah. And his idea was you have to subvert expectations of weakly held beliefs. Mm. If you subvert the expectations of strongly held beliefs, people double down. Yeah. And if if you confirm their pre-existing expectations, then they don't care. But a theory is interesting if you go, "Huh. I didn't know that. I feel like I could have known it, but yeah. I didn't know yeah. it." Wow, that's interesting. I'm going to go tell people that at a party. Um, I always thought that was like an int like a fun little like um, idea, yep. and I and I generally like I I think that's true. I used to, well, I still like Malcolm Gladwell to some extent, but like you can fit all mm. of his books into that into that like thing. I, I think truth aside, I think it's just like he's very good at subverting people's weekly held beliefs, and I think he's made quite the career on it. Yeah, I think I think that's an excellent little thing. I hadn't thought about it that way, but that sounds like an excellent paper. I. I'm glad you mentioned Malcolm Gladwell. He was one of the people I was trying to think of. Um, but yeah, I mean, we could also um, point to a lot of psychological papers that have since been debunked during the replication crisis, because a lot of a lot of lazy um, research work was a bit like that. It was just like, oh, look, this one simple trick actually does this surprising yes. thing. So yes, <laughs> it's a problem. By, by the way, funny enough, it's like real problem. The social sciences. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, excellent. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Fantastic to meet you, mate. Yeah, uh, fun, so, fun talking, to go. Matt. No worries, no worries, no worries. Cheers, Matt. Uh, do Talk you, later. Do you still have a little bit of time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's, let's go. Let's go, let's go. I'm There's, loving it. Because there, uh, there was a couple of specific things that I was, I was curious about. But on that point about, like, the social sciences and the replication crisis, like, this is, this is something Matt and I have an interest in. Like, I've published papers like in, in favor of pre-registration and methodological reform that like kind of open science practices as well. But this is a thing which we've noticed the the guru figures, like much the same way that the cryptocurrency traders can kind of point to, you know, the banks and the corporations screwing people over. And it's true. And the same thing with uh, our gurus will often say, you know, the replication crisis shows that like science is uh, has the pro these problems and things can't be replicated. And they're right in a large way, the same way they're right about critiques of the pharmaceutical industry. But what they then do is like apply no, like very, very, one, they don't really care about those criticisms. They just take them as delegitimizing. Like they're not actually involved in reform efforts or anything like that. And two, they then apply like an, a very credulous and much lower standard of evidence when it comes to things like the supplement 
industry or anti-vaccine rhetoric. So it's yeah. it's like a weird thing where it's just enough to criticize the mainstream. And then that means that, you know, whatever the alternative is, the credibility goes up, but it shouldn't, right? It should be that you, you just realize, okay, so this is bad. Pharmaceutical companies are bad, but that means supplement companies. We should be very skeptical. And, you know, like people like Joe Rogan, it feels like they're, they're constantly com- talking about, you know, the pharmacy industry and all the profits and all that kind of thing, which there is legitimate things. But then they, they shill supplements and which are overhyping, which are billion dollar industries. And hey, they, well, no one ever talks about the supplement industry, do they? The supplement industry is absolutely massive. And there's so many people are selling these crazy pills with crazy promises and with no evidence to back it up. I mean, it's yeah. exactly what you said. It's, it's you, you take the credit, you criticize the thing, you build up your standing with that. And then all of a sudden, well, now you're the expert. This is something I try to be very careful about is because I feel like anyone in the position of criticism has this vulnerability or like or has this propensity, like you could do that because people start to look to you. It's so like people all the time ask me like, oh, what what crypto do you hold? Oh, what finance? A- as if because I can criticize that I'm now a like expert in it. It's like, no, 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 that's that's not how this works. And if I taught you anything, you should know like that's not how this works. Um, but it, yeah, it, it is certainly the case that, you know, I, I've actually... Actually, I was very interested in the replication crisis for a while. Like before CoffeeZilla, I had like a like a sort of like a pop science YouTube channel, and um and I started to get bothered by the uh, like a the videos I was producing, and then like b like the like science YouTube as a whole. I was like, oh, this kind of isn't that interesting. Then I got looked into science, and I was like, oh man, there's all sorts of problems in science. Like it's not just like <laughs> pop science that kind of like has tr- <laughs> troubles, but it's like science has 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 problems. But but it is certainly not the case that like you would look at that and go, well, it's all like we just should throw it all out. Like that is the um, that is certainly not the answer. I, I'm definitely of the reformer mindset. I mean, these things have to be solved uh, because, you know, what else are we going to do? Are we going to go back to the days where you just trusted a guy who is hawking you, you know, pills or whatever for better or worse? It's sort of like the case that the big pharma industry is the best we have. Sort of like people's criticism of education. They're like, education sucks. Okay, great. Uh, what are you going to homeschool? Look at the stats on homeschool. It's like not better. Uh, yeah. You know, ironically, it's like usually the case that public education for all its very, very documented faults is the best we have. And this is the case of a lot of our institutions for all their faults. They're usually the best we have. But this is one of the criticisms that we get recurrently is because we are so critical of the people in the alternative ecosystems that we're essentially, you know, we're just rubber stamping the institutional take, whatever the mainstream take is, that's the right one. And we're not, we're actually not, but you can see, I can see why people would uh, like kind of go to that as the, you know, if you're saying like that, if you are defending the track record of science, for example, in the pandemic, like noting Yes, there were changes in public health policy. Yes, there are things which uh, decisions which can be rightfully criticized, and there are things for which the scientific evidence isn't great and is overstated by people and so on. But like, still, the track record is amazing. We had a a vaccine produced incredibly quickly, which were vaccines produced incredibly quickly that were extremely effective, right? And that shouldn't be lost sight in the in the kind of hears of the discussion, but highlighting that gets now presented as like, oh, so you know, you're you're you pray at the church of Fauci, and, and uh, it's it it is difficult to walk that that tightrope of like because the message is not just accept what the pharmaceutical industry says, just just accept certainly not, you know, yeah, yeah, and, and like that's why sometimes like when when my <laughs> wax is lyrical about you know don't do research and don't think i know how that sounds to people but i also know that matt is not saying like don't develop an interest and look critically at studies he's just saying acknowledge your limitations and you're like you said you know you just learned about mrna vaccines last week what you should care about is the people who have spent entire careers on those vaccines and not just one of them 
what the majority of them think because there's always yeah. crazy people. There are always crazy people. Or people that are just wrong. They have their pet theories and their pet theories are just like flat wrong. I mean, that happens all the time. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, you know, I always view these things as like, uh, what is it? It's like the thesis, antithesis, th synthesis. I think like culture is always moving in some type of like a title direction. And I think for a while there was like, I think these anti-establishment figures kind of rose up. And then I think you guys are a reaction to that a little bit. Like, I don't know. Um, I don't see you guys as being establishment shills at all. I think, I think you are just doing a very similar criticism that like, I'm not saying you guys are the same, but, um, just in the way that establishment figures should be able to be criticized by mm. people, anti-establishment figures are the same way. And the problem is usually anti-establishment figures aren't used to any real criticism because nobody at the establishment is going to criticize you. So it's like you're not used to it. And so you go, oh, well, you know, you kind of get this free pass. But I think there's rightly a response because these uh, a lot of people are getting huge audiences, almost as big as the like mainstream media sort of isn't that mainstream anymore. Like you look no. at the viewership of CNN and Fox and you put it against like the big podcasters, it's who's really mainstream. Yeah, yeah. And there's, uh, you know, you talked about the the response to critics and it being so, it's not even vitriolic. It's almost like you're immediately cast as a hater, right? There's basically only two positions that I think critics are allowed to fall into by guru types. Okay. And it, it's one, yeah. that you're an obsessive critic or two, that you're an uninformed dilettante who doesn't, you know, know enough to criticize them. That's, there is no like good faith, well-informed critic. And the, um, whenever I saw a video that you, you had critiqued uh, somebody who was uh, kind of promoting an AI investment uh, system. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and they did a response radio to right like at least this is what it was framed up but it seems so familiar because there's so many times with the figures that we cover where they're responding to criticism but it becomes clear they haven't read the criticism or they haven't watched the thing that they're responding to and it's it's almost unbelievable because you're like but surely it, you know you would at least just listen you know like i listen to what the people are saying so that I know how I can argue, you know, against their point. But it it's sometimes really impressive that people can just like kind of they they have so much confidence. And you know, Matt and I think a large part of it is narcissism, but whatever your your view on that, they certainly have the level of confidence that like they don't feel the need to engage with the critical point. It's a, it's enough to just kind of dismiss it in a very backhanded way and and there's a guy a, an example would be there's a science writer called Stuart Ritchie you might be familiar with it or not he wrote a book I've heard of his name he wrote a book called science fictions it's very good and it, it's basically a critique of you know modern science and and pharmaceutical industry and and various things but he's a pro science guy he's just like you know highlighting issues right. with publishing stuff he wrote a detailed critique for the Guardian about the uh hunt the Hunter Gallery's Guide to the Gal uh, the Twenty First Century, Brett uh, Brett Weinstein and Heller Haynes book, and on their podcast, they said there's a hit piece in the Guardian written by a postmodern person who has no interest in science. Stuart Ritchie is like a scientist with a long published track record and has published books critical of science. He is the farthest thing from a postmodern person. But I was just amazed, like either they didn't look him up or they're just lying. But it's it's kind of impressive to me that, you know, I couldn't do that. I couldn't look in the camera and say that person is a postmodern person if I didn't know or think that. Yeah. What do you think that what do you think that is? Because uh, I, I, I don't think. I don't really believe in monoliths, and I think all of this stuff exists on a spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like there's like levels of self-awareness, there's levels of guruship and sometimes like 
when you have a podcast, people just start looking to you for advice. You're not even looking to give advice. I mean, that's like a pretty natural thing. Yeah. Um, so has there ever been somebody who's who you've criticized who says, you know what? I I agree or I've reflected or or sort of like has taken your thoughts in stride and said, hey, like, you're right. Maybe maybe I could do this a little bit better or mm, the closest is Robert Wright. Uh, the person who wrote why Buddhism is true and uh, non has a non-zero um, newsletter. He's he's a long time kind of uh, intellectual commentator, or political pundit. Um, and but even our episode on him was highlighting that you know in some respects he does fit the model of a guru because he's offering this like kind of uh, very cosmic worldview which eventually ties down to his political theories um as well and he's not afraid to do that but he is unlike other gurus in that he's very clear when he's making speculative claims and when he's uh you know kind of feels he's on firmer ground and he's also unusual in that he engages regularly with critics so like he came on the podcast yeah um, pretty unique and we had feedback with him but that that is rare. We had Sam Harris on. <laughs> oh, is Sam Harris a, uh, a, I guess, well, secular guru? Maybe exactly he's a secular guru. Yeah, uh, yeah of course he would be on y'all's list, right? Yeah, we, we did an episode on like a short thing that he did and he uh, didn't agree <laughs> with our analysis, but we ended up having a very long conversation with him. But like there... I, I'm I'm not throwing Sam under the bus by saying this, but I do feel that like maybe in the long term there were some parts where uh, you know his views shifted on on things, but at, at least in that discussion it felt very much like you're hitting up against someone that has has a very very strong position and confidence in their you know their views, so it's. Hmm. It, you're not going to shift people. And I, I think in Matt and I, our case, like we view what we're doing as like critically looking at the content and giving an opinion on it. But we're not claiming that we have, like a, that's the, the name of the podcast aside, we're just offering our perspective from our, you know, read on something and with, like our backgrounds on sure. a particular piece of content. So, it's it's kind of fine if people don't agree with it, but I would I would say to answer your question, it is very rare for the figures themselves to appreciate critical feedback. Like Lex immediately blocked us where, where we covered him. Oh, and, uh, oh. the but he well he blocked us before because we we just said some or at least he blocked me because I said something critical about Eric Weinstein. So uh, I think that's uh, you know a lot of people just do they all run in the same camp. I the thing is, I I like Lex. I probably would like Eric. I mean, I'd at least have a conversation with him. Um, I don't know if coming on here is going to oh, uh, it's, get him get mad at me. May, but well, no, usually okay. I mean, I feel like, no, I, I really feel like, look, you should talk to everybody. I mean, I, I mean, in the spirit of ha talking to anyone, if, you know, if we can talk to anybody, it, Am I, yeah, the way that I view it is like, well, one, I don't think so. Like there, there are petty people who would, who would be, you know, an, annoyed, but they're usually people that you would want to talk to. Uh, but in our case, it's kind of the position that you stated, which like, I'm, I'm pretty fine with people talking to whoever they want to talk to, you know, talk to a neo-Nazi if you want, but you have to be responsible for what you say to them and what, what you do. By talking to sure, them. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, no. You, you know, this is interesting too. Like, I also think it's kind, it's kind of strange because like there's a lot of people um, I'd have a conversation with that I might disagree with, but like, like Joe Rogan, hmm. I really don't like his takes on COVID. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think he's been like deeply irresponsible with his, with his, uh, platform. At the same time, it's like, ah, yeah, I'd totally go on there. And yeah. generally, I've enjoyed his podcast. I think he has some great guests on. Uh, he's a good interviewer for the most part. And so I'm like, I'd love to go on a show. So it's kind of this interesting thing where I don't know, that always bothers me. 
seems like in internet communities, there's always like this, like these clicks that form that uh, I was just, I, I, the only reason I bring this up is I was just talking to somebody and this normally doesn't happen to me because usually I stay out of clicks altogether. I just like stay yeah. on my own. But just recently I've gone on a few podcasts and already I'm, I'm reminded of like high school because I, I was going on this podcast and or I was talking to somebody about going on their podcast and I said, oh, you know, hey, what's da da da? And they go, oh, well, yeah, that might be, a, be able to be possible. But because you just went on so and so and they just had a fight with this other guy, <laughs> I have to check if it's OK. And it's like three levels removed from what I actually like. We never talked about this person. I was like dumbfounded by it. And it just made me realize, oh, am I just not aware of all these dynamics like, that are going on? That's that's interesting. It's so strange. It's interesting to to hear because like my impression is actually the kind of reverse. Well, not not that there aren't people, you know, there's a lot of online cliques and there's a lot of people that are very sensitive to criticism. That is that is definitely true. But I I also feel that the YouTube ecosystem is particularly prone to these like dramatic blow-ups between people and like feuds right and maybe it's something about the visual medium that makes it like possible or the 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 ease with which people can like kind of do reaction videos you know to people's content and they can clip you out they, they yeah they can also like hey check out this clip of yeah. this guy trashing you and it's like oh my gosh they trashed me and then you missed the whole thing where they like said you were great but yeah. you're you're suggesting, like from what you've just said, it's that you've largely avoided that, uh, despite being active oh, in that ecosystem. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, no, no, no. I I just in general tried to avoid making friends on YouTube. Like, I, I mean, be, no, no. Well, it's kind of like because of the fact that I, I I do have YouTuber friends, but I always pick ones that I'm almost like I'm positive they would never do a scam. They're no, oh, yeah. like, they're not even <laughs> grift adjacent. Like, they're not even close to that world. Like, they're a gamer or something, you know, random. It's, it's, I can't, if I can't, because what I realized is, you know, you talk to these fin financial people, if you become friends with them, then it's very tough to criticize them later when it turns out they promote something shady. And it's like, well, you can't say anything. So I really try to, it's kind of hard because the, the, like, as your profile gets a bit bigger, everyone wants to talk to you and they want to be nice to you. And it's like hard to deny that, like, oh, it feels good. They want to talk. They they care about me, but they don't care. They just want to use your platform. But uh, but also it's like it's hard not to want to build that network. But to some extent, I've tried to like tried to stay aloof a bit because I think in my position you kind of have to be independently voiced. You yeah. can't have like your own. I did, to some extent. I didn't even think about that consideration, but it seems obvious now that you would need to to like be wary of that. And actually, that kind of links to a question I had for you about a, a difference I've noticed in the kind of people we cover and the kind of people you cover. Because there is overlap that like there's there's definitely overlap in techniques and and rhetoric and and some of the figures overlap. But one thing that um in the people that we look at, with with a couple of exceptions, they haven't much gotten into like minting their own coins or releasing NFTs. Like some of them have talked about it. Some of them have conversations with figures in cryptocurrency or that kind of stuff. But like by and large, they're doing the traditional thing of, you know, having advertisers on their podcasts. They have Patreon accounts or they have merchandise, like that kind of thing. And sure. Yeah, I'm also sort of interested, uh, just from a, an anthropological point of view in a way, in like the Twitch streaming ecosystem. And there, it seems much more common for people to have been involved in, you know, like cryptocurrency or, or NFTs. And the, I wonder, do you have any feeling about like why that, the because it seems like an obvious thing that you know Jordan Peterson could make bank from releasing NFTs and yeah. stuff. I, I but but I just don't think Jordan like Jordan Peterson. Hmm. Hmm. Like I I think you could fairly criticize Jordan Peterson as like, insofar as what I've seen of him is like a reactionary. Uh, but would he, but he's not really like the um like you have to be a grifter who cares a lot about money. And a lot of these guys who I follow 
all they think about is money. Like they, they're constantly looking for that is the end. For some people, the end is not money. For some, it's, it's fame. For some, it's attention, just like a raw attention. For some, and so they all have all these different motivations. And in a lot of cases, uh, minting a crypto coin would be counterproductive to establishing a long-term fan base. I mean, it's like you could ruin your reputation on that. Why would you risk it? So, and then also like, to some extent you wonder, okay, well, what if these people, um, like a lot of my people are, I feel like they know what they're doing. I wonder how many of your kind of guys you go after are like knowingly grifters versus like, they just know how to talk successfully. Like mm. to a crowd, you know, you know what I mean. I, I don't know how to how to parse this successfully, but there's no that's a, that that makes that makes sense because like we we often highlighting there's a kind of like superpower with like fluency at speech and metaphor and like the ability to reference technical terms and you know kind of dredge up references that make you look very impressive. There's like this verbal fluency, which is the superpower but way it, overrated way yeah, overrated yeah. by humans i don't know why it's like it, and people just lose their mind when you can use the english language uh fluently as you said i it, you know i actually thought of just like this indictment i just read so there's this indictment of this guy i forget his name so i don't want to say it unless i butcher it but he basically just got accused by the sec of pumping and dumping all these uh crypto coins and in the indictment, he says, black and white, or, or one of these guys, one of his co-conspirators says, F these guys were robbing them blind, okay? That is on the far extreme of negative intentionality, right? There are influencers that I've talked to who I believe are somewhere in the middle there. They want the money. And if you ask them, they would say, well, I don't want to hurt anybody. But they really don't put two and two together. Like, of course, you're hurting somebody. Money doesn't come from nowhere. You are getting money. Uh, your audience is probably losing money. So so they don't actually, they try not to think about it, right? And, and then you have the guy who's like, he's like, no, 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 we're robbing these people. And so that's what I'm trying to, That's I guess that's what I'm trying to get at is. is uh, No, that's a, that makes perfect sense. Because that, like, that contrast is I cannot imagine, even behind closed doors, most of the people we cover, they would never say that. And and they, I think like even the ones that are profit motivated, like I, I think that it is still they do have a lot of like faith in that what they're doing is is right, and the, like it sounds like you're dealing with more people who yeah, <laughs> no, well, it's, the, it's the finance world. I mean, it attracts the <laughs> most like. It attracts people who all they want is money, ends justify the means, sort of the 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 worst of the worst. And some in some of them do. I don't want to say all, but certainly some. And crypto especially was notorious, especially in the beginning. It was all the rejects from finance who weren't allowed to trade because they'd already been barred by the SEC. They'd come to crypto and start grifting in the crypto world. So like it's literally like the worst of finance would trickle in. Um and it, it kind of uh, matriculate down. It was, it was, it was terrible. I know this uh, is a this is possibly like a very specific example, but I'm just curious about the psychology. Maybe it applies more widely because, like, Jake Paul, for example, is insanely wealthy, right? Has has attention on him for all sorts of reasons, right? Like the boxing alone would would be something that could drive attention, and to me. It, it's insane that like he would want to, you know, like pump and dump cryptocurrencies because it seems like I get why some people would want to do it because it's their, it could make their, you know, income. Right. But he doesn't need that. So like, just, I'm just asking you, like, I square the circle for me. Like, I can't, explain, I can't, I, I can't explain it. Okay. You know, I never understood this actually. I, um, this took me a while. It was actually explained to me by a friend of mine who like knows, who understands influencers really well. It's a psycholo it's psychology thing. So when you first look at influencers, you think, oh, they're making tons of money. Why would you do anything? Why would you sell your fans out? What you don't see is the envy 
in Los Angeles. There is an incredible amount of competition and trying to keep up with all your fellow influencers that borderlines on the pathological. So you're doing great, but hey, the guy next to you, he's got more followers than you. Okay, well, I got him to get more followers. Oh, so you get more followers. Well, actually, hey, that guy over there, he made more money than you this year. Well, how do you make more money? Oh, he found this like new trick. Well, what do you do? What do you do? Because I'm just doing, I'm just doing like a little sponsorship right now. No, 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 no. The real money is in crypto ads. He did a crypto ad and he made all this money. You go, oh, I got to do my crypto ad. He's got a crypto ad. I got to have a crypto ad. He's got a car. I got to have a car. He's got a mansion. I got to have a mansion. So it's, it's this competition that I didn't understand before because I never moved out to LA. I just stayed in Texas where I've always lived. Um, you know, I, I'm just like living a pretty normal existence with my wife and just like my friends from just like, you know, growing up and uh, and people I met normally. But when you're in this L.A. world, it's a completely different ballgame. It's not the same. So I, I, I think that really answers your question to how you could get into this world where it's never enough. Um, it's a lot of that. And then when you have the car, when you have the mansion, you're living way beyond your means and you have to have income. So it's like, well, now I got to do the ads. I got to do this. I got to do that because I've, I've got all these payments to make. I got to keep the cycle going. I got to keep the rat race going. Yeah, so that I th that does answer it. And that's, I just wouldn't have considered that. Like even factor. Neither in. would I have. I, <laughs> somebody had to explain it to me who knew about the LA culture because I didn't understand it. I was like, I don't get it. Like, what's the big, I, I don't understand why you would chase this. And they go, no, you have to. So once they explain it, I go, oh, that makes so much sense in like a really weird way. So they, uh, there's a there's a question I have, which I know you will have been asked a bazillion times, and I'm probably sick of it. But I I still I still am curious because like Matt and I, right, we criticize public figures, and there's the potential, you know, that they could respond very negatively to that, and like you yeah. know, blocking us, no big deal, but like suing us or something could, you know, it, it is something you have to consider when you're making like public criticism, especially of like wealthy people. But in our case, you know, we are we are going after the kind of people that we talked about, you know, like kind of public intellectuals. And sure, there are people like Russell Brand and whatnot, but by and large, they don't need to be concerned with us because, you know, they have their huge audiences and they people are not going to stop listening to Russell Brand's conspiracy theories because he got like a a critique on our podcast. But in your case, you you can cause people financial damage, and you obviously are dealing with extremely wealthy and as we just discussed, people whose morals are often like Some, sometimes you know, sociopathic people. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how, like, you know, you have a wife as well. So I'm just wondering, like, are you just risk prone or like you don't think about it that much or like are you really, really uh, careful or, yeah. Yeah, it's some combination. I mean, I mean, I, I am somewhat risk tolerant for sure. I just hate like bullies. I hate the idea that somebody would just bully me into silence. So that propels me a lot. Um, that kind of like, I guess, chip on my shoulder. Um, <laughs> it's a good chip. It's a good chip. I think. Yeah, it just it just bugs me. Well, it's not even like me. They but like I watch them bully everyone else. And so then I get mad. I'm like, all right, no, not not me. Uh, but. Yeah, I mean, we we take uh, precautions with that. Um, we do as much as we can. We have like certain types of insurance for like legal stuff, and you know, there's there's cons considerations you have to take there to try to protect yourself. But after you do, you cannot let it consume you because ultimately it is it is a complete distraction from the work. It will lead you nowhere. You will not produce any meaningful work. Worried. Uh, so yeah, you, you do all the precautions, you set up all the stuff, you make sure you can protect yourself. But besides that, you know, live and let live, I guess, so to speak. I always think about it like this. Um, my, I will much, I am much more likely to be die by a heart attack, a car crash, cancer, or anything like this than any kind of physical problem from any of these people. And that's like to take the most extreme hyperbolic example, right? 
But I think that puts the risk in perspective, right? Every job has risks. Being a pilot has risks. Doing, uh, you know, if you're a base jumper, you have risks. If you're a motorcyclist, you have risks. And every job you eventually decide, okay, am I comfortable with the risks? If not, I shouldn't be in this business. So what I've always thought, and this is what, one time my wife literally told me this. She's like, if you don't want to do this, well, you shouldn't be in this business. Like if you're scared about this. And I think that's the correct approach. You, you take precautions and then you realize this is the business of real journalism is you're not just like playing public relations for people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's beautifully said. And I, and we have a, you know, there's also, I don't know how much of it's, this is actually true, but it's just like a, a if I have a religious fear, if it applies to specifically this, that I, I still hold that, you know, if you, what you're criticizing is like what you're saying is true, right? You're, you're criticizing someone for something they did that you can demonstrate and like you can show why you are saying they did this, right? And it's, it's like you said, you know, you play people the clips and say, you said that, right? It, like, in, it feels to me like that has to count for something. Like someone, if there is ever a jury or something, they have to be able to see that, you know, yeah, look, but the guy did say that, right? And so it's a, it's okay to point out to people and, and that, you know, we, we talked about the interpersonal thing and that, that seems to me one of the bits that we often like kind of, uh, if we get in disagreements with people, I don't feel that being critical, harshly critical should be something that disqualifies you from the, you know, therefore having a conversation with someone or therefore like being able to discuss other aspects. Because like you said, it's not like everyone is equally terrible. You could cover someone who is doing something, you know, untoward and they they can argue back and say, yeah, but you know, I was I was doing it because of this. And it I think the there's a tendency, this tendency to treat like all criticism as if it's like just aimed to destroy the person, to like burn them to the ground. Mm -hmm. Like it's a mm. it's an unfortunate thing and it like I don't get <laughs> from your content that that is what motivates you. I do get that there are people that annoy you and that you feel they need to be like called out on what they're doing. But yeah. but that that sense that it's like a personal vendetta to destroy them. That that's another and I think that's really important because when that is there that that's what other people seem to imagine that motivates you. And if that was, you know, not you, but I mean, any critic. And yeah, if that, yeah, yeah, yeah. If that is what's motivating you, it wouldn't, it wouldn't last, right? Because you just get like, it just feels like that would be such an unsatisfying existence. It's, an, it's very empty. It's very empty because you never get a, there's no closure with that, right? There is no satisfaction. Listen, there have been people who, um, who were grifting and they've had their, grifting business harmed um <laughs> and i and i don't take uh i don't take pleasure like in that i don't like in them have i i it's really for the victims that i think about first and foremost i mean that's that's mostly what i'm thinking about is like it's almost sad i i talked to one actually i'll never forget this so i remember this is way back i don't want to give any hints because otherwise people people are really good at like picking out like <laughs> sometimes I have some some of like some of my fans are like they know the deep lore. So I'm not gonna give any hints this time. Uh I had this one guy though that I criticized him and I guess for a variety of reasons, his business, like like he had a business selling these courses, get rich quick scheme courses, and that business failed. And he texted me, he's like, Hey, I cannot pay my employees. I'm laying off employees because of you. I want you to know it's all your fault. I can't sleep, you know, I can't put food on the table right now. Um, you know, all these things that make me feel horrible. I'm like, I have no, that is not why I do this. It's mm. not about you. It has nothing. And that's what I told him. I said, listen, my criticism has nothing to do with you. I want everyone to be well fed and have a roof over their head, whatever. But the problem is, is that you were, you were taking money from people who were desperate who wanted to make a better life for themselves and you're selling them vaporware, you're selling them snake oil. So, th you know, th that's a little cold comfort. But I say this to say that, like, I don't particularly, you know, love, you know, there's some people like Sam Bateman Freed where I, I think I will probably be, I think he's done enough harm to where there will be a slight sliver of, you know, happiness <laughs> when he goes to jail. 
but but there's a side of it too where like you if you if you spend any amount of time thinking about his mother or his parents or it's like it's like yeah it's not that you take pleasure in that it's just it's just fundamentally that there is this bigger picture which is about all the people who've been affected by these guys yeah and that that, that is something like when we're when we're talking about people and they're saying, you know, but these people are very nice interpersonally. If you just spoke to them, you would. And it's like, no, that's never the point. We're not saying these people are like evil people slavering around, you know, thinking about how they'll destroy the world. It, I'm sure there's plenty of the, the gurus that we covered that we could sit down and have very nice dinner with and, you know, be regaled with interesting stories. But it doesn't change what they're actually doing. And the... the that's the thing we're critiquing, like, you know, the output and the rhetoric and, and that kind of thing. But um, there, there was, I, I realize I've kept you for quite a long time. And I, I, I have tons of stuff that I w want to ask, but, um, but there's no need to do it all in one go. So there, but there was one thing that I was curious about um, that I didn't want to forget to ask. So you are somebody who publicly advocates for like, more regulation of, uh, mm. you know, financial products or or at like sure. these relatively unregulated markets, and I was curious about that because you know, do you ever get like kind of labeled? Because like that that stands to me seems similar in a way for us saying like you know science is actually good. It's better than you know mainstream medicine is better than the supplement industry like people don't like that message and the notion that the government should regulate those markets it feels like at least that one you could get labeled as politically skewed in a particular direction and two like that you libertarian uh types would would take issue with that as a solution yeah uh, by the by the way i love talking i don't i don't mind talking i've actually kind of found a love for podcasts because i'm so used to these like these 10 minute videos I'll do, or even, you know, a long video for me is like 30 minutes. But having these, uh, the ability to just kind of spend some time with somebody is quite a luxury. So I, I don't mind at all. I'm oh, that's enjoying great. It, to the point. Uh, but yeah, so about my stance about regulation, I've never been criticized too strongly about it. And I guess maybe that's because when you look at the, the problems that I keep covering, it's so clearly a systemic problem as well as an individual problem. You can't take away the individual agency of Jake Paul to take the deal, but you'd be a fool to not see the commonality between him and all the other kind of influencer grifters. And all you have to do is ask, well, how do you stop this? Well, the answer is not rely on CoffeeZilla to make videos forever. You know, <laughs> the answer is clearly because that, you know, I only have so much time in the day. The answer is clearly you have to make some meaningful laws. Uh, that's the reason laws exist. And, you know, I don't know if I've ever spoken publicly, but it, I'm not like the biggest believer in, um, in like government. What do you say? Competency to fix everything. I think it, they face different, but very also big structural problems that business often face. Um, so I'm not like just this naive believer in the power of government to solve all problems. I mean, they, they certainly have issues. So, so I say that to say like, I'm not a naive believer in government or a naive believer in regulation, but I don't just like the fact that you acknowledge there's, you know, a replication crisis doesn't exclude you from believing in the ability of science to discover truth. Just because you acknowledge that there are problematic regulations doesn't prevent you from believing in the need for regulations for some areas of life. Um, and I think when you explain that to somebody, it's pretty hard to argue with that. I mean, I, I think it's, you have to be pretty disingenuous to not kind of see that as, e even if you don't agree personally, you go, okay, I know how you get there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I completely, that, that's the impression I took and I, I didn't uh, like clock you to be, you know, <laughs> just saying like, please government come in and take control of all these, nationalize it, nationalize it. But I, I American content, like the libertarian response, especially online, just seems, you know, like so vitriolic at times that when I heard you mention regulation on like Lex mm. Friedman, I think I winced because I was just like, oh, he must get 
Oh, <laughs> yes. oh no. You know what? You know what? Like, I, I actually love libertarians. Look, they just want to live and let live. I think it's a beautiful philosophy. Um, there are just challenges when you have a, like we talked about how complex our society is. And you have these systemic issues pop up that are not obvious, uh, that would pop up. And you eventually realize like there have to be mechanisms that are not profit based. Like you have to have rules that have nothing to do with everyone earning a, like more dollars. Um, and I think when you, when you like look at grifters and scammers, like what's interesting about it is frequently what they're doing might not be illegal. Oftentimes mm. it is some purposeful exploitation of a lack of regulation. So I think when people see that, when people see those exploitations of the law, it's pretty easy to see like why, hey, okay, you don't have to be a big, uh, believer in, you know, the, 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 the nanny state or anything like that to see the problem with somebody exploiting a grandma due to a loophole that you can with free speech say that your pill is going to cure Alzheimer's. Everyone can see an issue with that. It doesn't take a, you know, it, even if you're a bleeding heart libertarian, you can see a problem with people promising pills that don't work to grandma like that. That is a problem. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a nature of what I do that I get a little less flack and I'm just really not that interested in politics anyway. So I, d I don't know if I attract those types. Well, that's like the the really politically heavy handed, you know, I'm sure everyone has political opinions, but yeah, but that's good. That's that's like positive to hear. I I just, uh, you know, in the, in the same way, we occasionally build ourselves as like relatively at least attempting to be a political in the episode. Like, obviously, we have our political opinions like everyone does, but uh, our show is not a political show. Right. It's it's like. It's supposed to be analyzing the rhetoric and, and techniques of, of guru types. And you can do that if you're conservative or, uh, you know, yeah. a, a bleeding heart liberal or a libertarian. For that matter, they can do it too. <laughs> They're just, they, I love libertarians as well. They're just a, an interesting bunch in America. But um, yeah, so. So, I was sorry, I was going to jump in. Some of my best friends are libertarians and we like, <laughs> yeah. we'll have these long fights over like coffee about why taxation is theft. And I'm like, it's not theft. But then I'm like, how could you think this? But then, you know, in real life, they're super nice. So. Yeah. I they, like I, you know, I grew up in, in Northern Ireland where we have the NHS. So like for, for a large part of my life, I didn't realize that people had you know, when you go to the hospital that anybody had to ever worry about that. So that's definitely colored like my my interpretation of things like growing up with like socialized sure. healthcare and that, that kind of thing. But but I'm I'm not I always get accused of bringing up Northern Ireland, so I've just mentioned it in passing. But um uh so it, I I am still uh like <laughs> aware of your time and I is there is there anything on your list of notes about the gurus or or, or points that we didn't cover? Um, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, actually, there is one thing. Okay, I'll I'll pitch I'll pitch this to you. Okay, and uh, this is gonna involve sort of a confession on my part, which is weird because uh, <laughs> it's sort of like I'm intrigued, and I I say this with all with all sincerity. I mean, I I I really mean this. So, uh. So this is going to go back to the Lex Friedman thing. I actually wasn't planning on saying this, but I think it's an interesting, like maybe data point for you. So I rem so uh, when I was going to, I've kind of gone through. All right, how do I how do I say this? So I've been vaguely aware of Lex Friedman for a while. Hmm. I didn't watch a lot of his content. Then I started watching a little bit of his content, and then I stopped for a time. And I don't remember what my general impression was. I was like, oh, this is kind of an interesting show. But I was like, kind of thought to myself, oh, is this like a pop psychology guy? Mm. You know, sort of a Mac Malcolm Gladwell figure, you know, all that kind of stuff. When I went on his show, I have to say, I was actually impressed with him. Mm. Uh, and I think it's interesting for you guys, because uh, obviously I'm sure that's probably sort of how you guys view him. Um, he's he's really sharp. We ended up talking for eight hours. And uh, yeah, I don't know where that what that means to you as like a data point, but Coming from a guy who's reasonably skeptical as a rule as well, 
I was pretty like, I don't know, maybe I fell under the charm a little bit, but I was like, ah, this this guy's pretty pretty interesting. I, I um, so that that is interesting, and I I would say, and when we did our coverage of Lex, our our like main point was basically that um th- that like in one sense he's he comes across as a techno monk, like you know, in a similar way to Jack Dorsey, that you oh, know, sure. they very very invested in technology, but like with this like very strong spiritual side to it which is which is just creating when you are like a uh cynical you know like a person or somebody from like a culture where expressing love <laughs> un- unconditionally just just like feels you know so on the aesthetic thing there's there's just that but it, but that was not uh that that was not like that, that that was noted as just you know like a fairly aesthetic practice or or preference that you know it doesn't apply really make any difference some people like that some people won't and and that's the way it is but with with Lex the critique that we had and like the episode he did with you various episodes I've heard him do with figures are good interviews that I like like I really like the interview he did with you and I I think you covered a whole bunch of interesting things and he's a good interviewer right like i yeah. i I, know no, some, I agree i know some people like think he's too dry but i i think that with the right people he he really does delve into stuff in an interesting way so i enjoy some of his content the part that we had the strongest critique for is the the potential for uh like that that kind of narrative about that you're motivated by love and that you you just want to make the world a better place but you're you're going to interview Andrew Tate and Kanye West and okay, yeah. I I understand I actually genuinely think that Lex is motivated by what he says you know the intrinsic uh, belief that he can have a conversation with them that is worthwhile and help to understand them but i i think that in a bunch of ways and it's not just lex that does this it's other people that there's a lack of critical reflection on the the like the possible downsides to just having a conversation so lex in particular spoke with joe rogan about uh encouraging joe rogan to have an interview with trump right and rogan I've got plenty of critiques of Rogan, but Rogan said he wouldn't have Trump on because you can do a lot with having an indulgent conversation with someone where you you actually can really help their image. And and Lex mm. was like, yeah, but you aren't responsible if other people, you know, for how other people think. And he actually suggested, wouldn't it be fun to like have a long conversation and and you know you could have Alex Jones on as a chaos element. And to me, if you're if your position is that you're about love and increasing, you know, science's relevance in the world and whatever, encouraging Joe Rogan to do an interview with Donald Trump and saying there's no, you know, the political impacts are not shouldn't be Joe's consideration and maybe add Alex Jones in for fun. And then you're going to interview Andrew Tate, who's like an overt misogynist and, uh, you know, various other things, multi-level scammer. I I feel there has to be the ability to really critically go at people. And you, for example, have that ability. Various other people that I see do. Um Lex, I'm less certain of. He was he was he was critical with Kanye, but he often reverted back to, you know, look, you're a guy that's just trying to do good in the world and like mm. he's a guy that's pumping out anti Semitic here. Like that's not- yeah, yeah. Kanye's anyway. like he's beyond he's beyond the pale. No, no, no. That makes that makes sense. I uh, the, I I think the Rogan comment's interesting. I think yeah, I think probably that was that was content brain. That's what that's what sometimes uh uh people call it on YouTube. They call it content brain, where you're just thinking like, what is gonna make the viral hit? Like they just know like because as as you put out stuff and and these systems give you all sorts of uh feedback loops. Sometimes you can get stuck in this thought of like. Oh, how can I get like the most entertaining? So I obviously tr- Trump with Alex Jones would probably for a lot of people just be funny to watch. Uh, and probably also, <laughs> you know, for, for a variety of other reasons, probably, uh, 
not further the the love in the world but <laughs> yeah. um certainly i think it'd be f- like probably very funny to w- witness so i think that that's probably the thought but yeah no i i didn't mean i didn't mean to like um i'm not challenging you guys about it i just wanted to give you guys that data no, point because yeah i mean you know it's from just- the pers- from the perspective of i am also like i actually it's i have this like love love hate with like all pop science types like i love malcolm gladwell i have a soft spot for malcolm gladwell even though i know like so much of his <laughs> stuff is like kind of you know whatever uh and uh and so when i went to lex i kind of thought of him as like oh like i i like his podcast but i think he's a little bit like you know like the the pop science stuff but then i was uh, w- when we talked afterwards about the ai stuff i kind of thought that the ai thing was kind of a side like byline in the same way i'm a chemical engineer i'm not yeah i didn't actually ever go do anything with my chemical engineering degree i just have like credentials in it but um from what i heard i i i, I didn't like go fact check him afterward but everything he was saying he's pretty well versed we talked about llms and he he was uh he kind of like taught me some things about it. it's pretty interesting but anyway i didn't want to dwell too much on that i just wanted to kind of give that no, data point and because I, I i actually think like i i know that you weren't you know that like your point was not the litigate lex it's just like because we covered them recently it's all of these things are on my mind and uh sure. but the one thing that i will say in response to that is like the so that content brain thing that you reference like obviously because we we produce a show right and we know about downloads and that kind of thing um we we are also aware of stuff yeah, that people like or don't yeah. like like just for example we put out an episode where we had an interview with a, a cognitive anthropologist manveer singh who who specializes in shamanism and we were talking about the kind of overlaps between shamanism and, and gurus and it was for me it was great right it's like a academic kind of topic and really enjoyed it and and yeah. people did like it, but like that episode, for example, will get two comments. Whereas a, a recent episode that we did, which was a right to reply with somebody who we covered as a guru and got at times like not heated, but, you know, quite, quite contentious, has hundreds sure. of comments, right? Because like people yeah. like that more. So I get that, but I also have noticed from dealing with some people and I won't, I won't mention who because i don't want to throw them on the, the bus but like they did the right thing they're a content creator and they were considering the host brett weinstein at the time that he was promoting his anti-vax stuff right and yeah they knew that they would get a whole bunch of downloads and attention by hosting him and they didn't right they decided not to because they they kind of thought that it, it you know, that they would, they didn't have enough expertise and it was likely he would just, you know, say stuff that they couldn't respond to. And then, they, but when I was talking to them, they were like, well, where's the benefit for me not to have done that? Because I don't get the downloads. Nobody knows I made that editorial. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. And, and I, I was like, a horrible way to think about things. Yeah. So I was a horrible like, horrible no. ethical system. Wow. But, but you know, the, the correct thing is because you, you know, it's the right thing. <laughs> to do right like yeah. and, and that was when i was like maybe i don't have the exact same kind of approach as content oh, creators in some respect because no it, it, yeah yeah i feel no i i feel like that person's way off base that, that is a crazy thing to say i i think that person is just uh <laughs> is too is too far gone to some extent i mean i I just mean from the perspective of I'm all too sympathetic of the um, like like views and analytics is something you resist, but it's but it's like um, you've really achieved something if you've completely removed thought of analytics, and it's something that you're always like I personally am always working to pay attention to less, um, even as these platforms try to shove it shove it further in my mind. Because I think it's unproductive to art. I think it's unproductive to actual creating something like interesting or cool. But it, it but it is something that um, you know, we always we always try to focus on what we can measure. And I think it's just like views and downloads, and that's the easiest way to measure impact. But it's it's a poor proxy. So I'm always sympathetic to people who sort of get stuck in that loop. But ultimately, I don't think it's enough to just say that that's a thing. I mean, obviously. 
yeah, at some point there's some accountability for it. And like whoever, I, I don't know who that person was, but that's an insane thing to say. Like, <laughs> where is the good in that? Like, what do you uh, want to clap on the back? Yeah. Uh, no, I, yeah, it, you just, every, everyone just has to make their own line. And I think, I think um, we just have to recognize that analytics and like content does not produce good things for people's long-term satisfaction necessarily, like the focus on those things. It's like Goodhart's law, right? That which becomes a me like a target ceases to be a good measure. Um, mm. So we we target views because we think, oh, that's measuring satisfaction. But then it actually does is a poor proxy for like actual satisfaction. Yeah, and you know this this is a, in, in like a little part for me and Matt why we are like slightly better pleased, I think, than than some others in in similar spaces because we like we have academic careers, right? This is a yeah. side gig That's for great. us and and that allows us to like not really we've done advertisements but we like we've never we've never focused on that and if we want to do an episode which is with like an academic talking about shamanism and gurus we're just like yeah well we, you know we're doing it because we it's 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 fun so like we've already had more success than we ever intended or expected and that means that everything from there is a bonus but it is also the case that like i realized if i wasn't an academic mm. that the the metrics that your you know downloads and stuff it it's still you still notice and stuff like that and it would definitely become like you know academics have their own metrics is the h index and the um like the career ladder so you can't escape it it's just which ones you pay attention to yeah and everyone to some extent is just trying to fight the when when those biases can become bad there's nothing wrong with having a good career but when those biases towards careerism just become like sort of make you make bad ethical decisions or bad it like taints your decision making that it becomes a problem yeah what's the benefit um, <laughs> what's the benefit dude? <laughs> what's the benefit of making the right call that's so funny i need to know off the off the podcast who that was whenever yeah. we wrap this up yeah uh, well I, I need to hear about that uh well it's been an absolute pleasure and uh like it's i'm sure it's obvious but we really value like your content of what you're doing i'm i'm very glad i came across it and uh if if we are covering like the anybody in this space you'll probably get annoying dms so i, I apologize sure. for no, that. I, <laughs> I, no i i i love it i i love um <laughs> I love to connect with people because I so rarely get the opportunity to because I kind of have to stay wary. But uh, I, yeah, no, I had an absolute blast. You'll have to give your my best to Matt um, as well. I mean, you guys are absolute thrill to talk to. Very thoughtful, very insightful. Just uh, fun to kind of run the gamut of topics here. So thank you. Yeah, much much obliged and all the same back and and keep keep getting those bastards. <laughs> <laughs>